Hi, I'm your host, Vasco Duart. Welcome to the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, where we share tips and tricks from Scrum Masters around the world. Every day, we bring you inspiring answers to important questions that all Scrum Masters face day after day. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a Team Tuesday episode this week with Arya Omidvar. Hey, Arya. Welcome back. Hey, Vasco, and happy Tuesday. Absolutely. Happy Tuesday, everybody. So we're going to talk about teams in a minute. But first, share with us, what's the book that most influenced you in your career as a Scrum Master? Oh, it's a really, really difficult call. Uh, it's like asking me what's my most favorite movie um, or most influential movie. Uh, I don't have one. I have like, I don't know, 20, 30 of them. But if I have to pick one, I will pick something that probably is less referred to these days. It's called Peopleware. Um, I mean, the subtitle is Productive Projects and Teams, the third edition from 2016 by Tom DeMarco and Tim Lister. A and, whole Bible um, for us uh, in the agile world that have studied a little bit about the literature on, on teamwork in software, software yes. organizations, software development. So give us a, a, a kind of the, the short version of why you think this is uh, a critical book for Scrum Masters. Um, so the, the book, the first edition predates Agile. I think it's from late 80s. Uh, and then uh, they revised the book twice until it gets to the, to the version that, that I read. Um, and the book was written around the same time that all of the lightweight movement that led to the Agile movement uh, was shaping. Uh, Scrum, uh, XP, DSDM, all of the stuff, all of the good stuff. Um, and... The book is not really speaking the, the lingo of Agile today, uh, for the most part, but and uh, it also doesn't refer to a lot of the technical aspects of agility, iteration, uh, feedback, learning, those stuff, not so much. But it looks at knowledge work from a very new uh, perspective, or at least for me, it was very new. And uh, I mean, the, the name says it all. It says, hey, it's not just software or hardware. There is also such thing called peopleware. And that's the, the genius of the, of the modern, um, I don't know, one of our biggest um, achievements as, as, a, as a species um, to be able to come together and do things that we couldn't do uh, in, as individuals. And they look at uh, work, especially knowledge work from many different aspects. They look at off even like they go even to, to office space design and like workplace design. Um, uh, projects, That's quite visionary teams. if you think about when it was first published. Exactly. It, this book has aged so well. And that's one reason. If anyone knows uh, of, of the concept called Lindy effect. So if something that is old has stayed around, uh, it has good reasons for its existence. And this book today is is so relevant. And I would say because of that, probably it's it's much more important than many of the books that are coming out just now. In fact, it's 87, the first edition. So yes. uh, at yes. least about 10 years before the uh, lightweight the methodologies manifest. movement started taking uh, force. Uh, of yes. course, there were people working yes. with lightweight methods before, but it really started in the late 90s and the book was published in the late 80s, so a decade ahead of it. And I mean, if anyone wants to know uh, who would endorse this book, Fred Brooks endorses that this tells book. You, I mean, that, that tells you how old it is. Fred Brooks is, of course, the uh, author of The Mythical Man Month, one of the uh, most beautiful projects about uh, uh, software development, which includes a lot of insights that led me to my own thinking on no estimate. So definitely a great uh, recommendation uh, on its own as well. Yes. I mean, and I can see that I've read less than half of um, The Mythical Man Month. So uh, that one I definitely need to pick up. All right, so that, that's uh, that's quite a lot of books already. Let's leave our uh, dear friends and listeners to uh, sink into one or maybe both of those books for now. But uh, let's dive into the teams and uh, how sometimes they become their own worst enemies. So Arya, tell us a story of a team that you worked with and give us a bit of context and then walk us through how those small little things kind of started to develop over time and 
uh, eventually became a big problem for the team? Um, sure. Um, speaking of teams self-destructing behaviors, um, there is one that I have in mind that I've seen more than once. Um, it's, what I would say, one of the more prevalent um, anti-patterns of, of teams' behaviors um, that I would like to share. It's also a rather painful one to share because it hits maybe too close to home for, for so many of us. And uh, but I don't know. That's kind of my middle name. Tough stuff. Um, I, I, I it's not comfortable, but I'm I'm comfortable with not being comfortable. So I've learned that it's I, I was I wasn't born like that, but I had to learn that, especially as a scrum master. Um, so the thing is, um, if you want to give it a title, it's sacrificing trust, transparency and courage for friendship and friendliness. And what do I mean by that? I've seen teams that have um, behaviors inside the team, sometimes from an individual, from sometimes from multiple individuals, that they need to address because it is a destructive attitude. But um, they fail to do that, and um, so they fail to they address problems that they see. Is that what you mean? Um, the problems that are. Um, Often, well, in, in all of the examples that I have, they actually come from certain individuals. And, and um, I'm going to give you two examples. One of them was actually one that a team um, survived from, recovered from, and one a team that didn't. I will try to do my best to make it fast. Um, so I had this team, and they had one developer who was not carrying his own weight, uh, to put it, I don't know, mildly. He wasn't catching up. He had joined the team. He didn't come from a um, programming background. He was picking up, and um, he, wasn't, he wasn't really um, meeting the expectations. Um, he had all of the support, as, a, as far as I know, and... Um, help of the team, which is the most important thing in, in such situations. However, he was still not meeting um, the, the expectations. And because of that, he was dragging the team down. Um, and unfortunately... And, and do, this, you, do you mean that the team already felt that? Like that there was already an understanding within the team that this team exactly. member was dragging them down? Yes, there was this understanding that the team was, this person was not um, lifting or, or, yeah, was not, I mean, to put it in one sentence, he wasn't delivering. Um, and um, so, I mean, here, if there is a scrum master or, um, I don't know, team lead or um, a figure like that, they usually have to take um, leadership of such stuff and, and try to um, make it clear to that person that, hey, um, let's say, Jack, you are not um, delivering and we need we need this to change otherwise. Um, so they didn't case. address him then? Unfortunately, no. They just let not, it go? The, yeah, I mean, uh, they tried uh, from what I had heard. Um, I was not working with them um, closely. I, I, I was brought in when, when the situation was out of hands. Um, and um, by the time that I joined, um, it was a very painful situation. The the person who was um, now asked to most probably leave the team was like, "Where where does this come from? I didn't see this coming." And this is very unfair. And this comes from this um, thing that these days we try to be nice. And we sacrifice sometimes truthfulness for niceness. And we sacrifice, I would say, kindness and compassion for niceness. Because if you're kind, if you're truly kind to this person, th this person ha is resourceful. He is gifted. He, is, uh, he has potential. Maybe it's not here. You have to let them know that, hey, this is definitely not a place that you are thriving. So maybe some, somewhere else doing something else and making that transition uh, as humane for them as possible, as painless as possible. Um, yeah, I, mean, I do have a lot of problem with this word nice. These days we, we unfortunately sacrifice a lot of stuff for nice. 
And um, this is one. So if you are like, let's imagine that you're talking to Luke, our friendly scrum master out there, who's right now mm -hmm. facing a similar situation. What mm -hmm. would you tell Luke? So I would, I would tell Luke, uh, first of all, bring the team, uh, except for that person. Ask, make sure that this, how this person is not delivering, has he had enough time to, to deliver and all of that? Was he warned or not? If he wasn't warned properly, you have to bring him in and warn him for the first time. Hey, Jack, you're not delivering. The team is, uh, the team likes you, but uh, this cannot continue like this because we are a team. Um, it has to work professionally. And um, there is this, uh, I, I learned about this advice from uh Ben Horowitz's book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. I didn't finish the book, but I, I went far enough to, to come to this, to this uh, advice. Uh, the three warnings. So you, warn, you inform them first, hey, you're not meeting the expectations. How can I help you to do so? Second time, if they still don't, you tell them, hey, next time we're going to work on your transition because this is definitely not working. And then if the third time comes, and it's clear that this person cannot be a team member on your team. You make that clear that this, why this is the case so that they know that it's not some, I don't know, personal agenda or something. And at the same time, you give them full support to moving on to their next engagement. If they are looking for jobs, helping them with their CV, with references and all of that too. I remember make one... One story yes. of a team member that was exactly in that situation. And uh, I remember how painful it was for me as the Scrum Master to actually bring that first the warning, then the conversation in more detail, and then ultimately, of course, getting him the, the pink slip, as it said. Uh, but we, we did have beer afterwards and we, we kept in touch. And eventually he himself told me that, you know, that was the best thing that could ever happen to me because I moved on, I went on to another job and I really loved it. And I felt that it was the job for me. Right. Exactly. And there could exactly. be many reasons why that is. But uh, I think that one of the things that you said is very important. We need to take responsibility to make things clear, but we do not need to take responsibility for this individual's actions. That is their responsibility. And this is why sometimes separation is actually a very good solution because when a team member does not carry the weight of the team, then they are not a good team member anymore. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's there a painful are story, but uh, a necessary it is. story for us. It is. I, I remember the room. Uh, I mean, it's never easy to be in such rooms. It's, uh, it's painful. You, you feel the pain of that person who feels rejected, who feels uh, abandoned, but yeah. Um, you, you go through the hard stuff. Absolutely. And going through the hard stuff with the team is part of our job as well. Amen. Tuesday is team day here on the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast. But tomorrow we talk about something that goes beyond the work we do with the teams. We will talk about how to lead change and what our guests have learned from leading and participating in change programs during their career. See you tomorrow. We really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring. <laughs>